Assalamualaikum. Uh, good morning. Um, welcome. Uh, okay, so this is my first online class for sedimentology, uh, SIG 2004, here at the Department of Geology, University of Malaya. Um, as all of you are aware, the government has uh, announced uh, a restricted movement order uh, due to uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, we're going to just continue with e-learning uh, until everything subsides. And I, I hope uh, everybody's OK with this. Uh, just remember, uh, please keep safe. Yeah? Uh, there again. So uh, can still do some learning even there is no face-to-face -face class. Um, so let's start. OK, so um, to this week's topic, we're going to cover um, depositional environments and fascists and the method of interpreting the environments using Fasci's analysis. So, uh, just a recap, um, uh, just remind us all uh, what we've been learning for the past few weeks. Right? Uh, we've looked at um, the basic terminology and language to describe the character of clastic sediments and sedimentary rocks. That, that is in terms of textural properties, things like grain size, roundness, sorting, and so on. We've also discussed a little bit about the process of vitification, going from sediments to sedimentary rocks. How do they form? Uh, things that control uh, the process of vitification. Uh, and uh, how do this, uh, how does vitification and diagenesis affect things like permeability and porosity? We've also looked at the processes of transport and deposition, going from um, the agents of transport, types of fluid flow, subcritical, supercritical flow, flows, um, Reynolds numbers, laminar flow, and turbulent flow, and so on, uh, and how flows interact with grains. You know how grains can be transported as suspended load and bed load. We've also looked at um, the different types of sedimentary structures can, that can develop because of the interaction between fluid flow and the grains. And more specifically, we looked at uh, these um, sedimentary structures that we call bed forms, things like cross beds, ripples, plain beds, which are formed by unidirectional currents. Okay, so this week we just we're going to focus on. Uh, I'm going to introduce you to a new concept. Um, this concept is called uh, depositional environments. Okay, so I hope uh, all of you still remember the source to sink cartoon, right? So sediments come from a source, usually highlands, let's say a mountain range at the back here. On this continent, and the, the, the older rock becomes eroded and transported and deposited, and it can be deposited in different localities, different settings. Right? So, it, it does not all of the sediment just goes straight into the deep water zone, deep water area, but it can be trapped in in different areas uh, on land and also in in the oceans. Right? So, you can have sediments being um, Accumulating in deserts, sediments accumulating in lakes, in in parts of the river, on beaches, on the shelf itself, and even in large submarine fans, uh, really in, in really deep waters. Right. So yeah, classic sediments accumulate in a wide range of settings, right, in in different areas uh, on, on our planet. As an example here, I have um, two photos uh, from Google Earth, and they are showing you two uh, relatively different deposition environments. One is an aerial photo of the, this is a Pahang Delta on the eastern coast of Peninsula Malaysia. And in terms of the deposition environment, we call this a delta, right? So that's a different environment. Now, on the right hand side, you have another deposition environment, right? And this is, in, in this case, this is a braided river system. You can see a channel in the middle with bars of sand around it, right? So that is also a different environment. Right? 
So what do we mean by a drug free environment? Well, let's go to the term environment first. Environment uh, means your surroundings, right? Surroundings. Uh, a drug free environment means your surroundings in terms of sedimentary deposition. So different drug free environments will have different processes uh, interacting with the sediments. And because of the different processes, you get a different distribution and also a different character to, to the sediments there. Right? So individual deposit environments have a characteristic set of processes and resulting deposits. Okay, so despite looking random, right? Uh, uh, despite the randomness of many processes in the surface, there's actually a high degree of predictability in nature. You know, if you, let's say you look at this kind of deposit environment here, this is a fluvial deposit environment with rivers, yeah. this is a meandering river system, and if you go to any meandering river system in, in the world, they will share similar uh, characteristics in terms of the types of sediments uh, which are deposited in, in, in the environment, right? So. There's a high degree of predictability, we say, right? Because certain processes form certain deposits. And because of this, certain deposits are typical of a certain depositional setting. So, an example here, let's say you are a sedimentologist, there's a sedimentologist, and he's studying this different environment here, this, fluvial, this specific fluvial depth environment. So, what he or she does, she or she goes there, takes samples, maybe in terms of, uh, maybe take some cores penetrating into the substrate in different localities, uh, look at the morph geomorphology of the, of the river system, uh, maybe, maybe doing some trenches along these exposed sandbars here, and come up with a conceptual model of how does the environment look like, looks like in terms of sedimentology. And he or she, the geologist, will come up with a map which looks something like this. So, from that original photo of the study environment, the sedimentologist now looks at the environment in another way, just looking at the distribution of sediment deposit type. So, when the sedimentologist sees the channel into the sedimentology, what he or she sees is a meandering body of sand. And the sand can be divided into different types uh, depending on the bed forms. Maybe you have dunes on, in this area here. But here you have sands with um, plain beds, right? And then when he or she looks at the point bar beside the channel tail right here, what the sedimentologist sees is a finer grain sand and it's characterized by lots of ripples rather than the, the higher energy bed forms you see in the channel tail. Right? And then when the sedimentologist looks at the floodplain around the channel, what he or she sees is just deposition of fine grain silt and clay and showing features like um, lots of vegetation, so you see uh, rooting. Uh, you see uh, animal footprints, uh, desiccation cracks, and so on. And in the, the vegetated areas here, uh, where you have swamps and so on, you can have deposition of peat, right? So you come up with a conceptual model of the environment in terms of deposition, a deposition environment, a deposition model in this case, right? So basically, you have divided the whole depositional environments into different depositional elements. And each depositional element will have a characteristic assemblage of deposits. Coarser sand in the channels, finer sand in the point bars, uh, finer sediment in the flat plains, and peat in the swamps. Right? And you get the, these different kinds of deposits in different areas because different types of deposits represent different depositional processes. 
right? So you have high energy, you need that kind of flow in the channels themselves, lower energy uh, flow on the point bars, and very low energy uh, on the flat plane, right? So you get different uh, different uh, deposits developing. So yeah, uh, these different deposits then will have different texture properties, will have different sedimentary structures, and also other kinds of different characters, right? So these deposits, we call them, these are the basic building blocks of your depositional environment. And we call these distinct deposits formed by different processes, fascists. Right? And the rule is that there is a tendency for a given environment, let's say in this case, this river here, to be associated with a particular assemblage of fascists. Right? Um, there are some fascists which are unique to only certain kinds of environments. Or to, uh, a group of fascists will be more typical of a river environment rather than a deep water environment and so on. So you can use fascists to interpret uh, ancient different environments. Right? So uh, right, uh, until now, we've just been talking about sediments, right? modern day sediments. So you have a map here and you are, the, uh, you are uh, you are identifying different kinds of deposits, right, in terms of sediments. But you can also use the fascist concept for sedimentary rocks. So remember, all of these um, these deposits here can be lithified after burial and preserved in the rock record as sedimentary rocks. You can have sandstone now with cross bedding here and kind of lamination, fine grain rippled cross laminated sandstones in, the, in ancient point bars and mudstones being dominant in, in ancient flat plain. So now I give you a more formal definition of what a fascist is. A fascist is, is a body of rock or sediment characterized by a particular combination of mythology, rock type, and physical and biological structures that bestow an aspect that is different from the bodies of rock above, below, and laterally adjacent. So in this case, just an, as an example, your laminated sandstones in the channels are a distinct fascist. They are different from your cross bedded sandstone fascist, and different from your ripple sandstone fascist, and also uh, different from your rooted muscle and coal fascist in this case. They were formed by different processes, and they were deposited in different areas in your depositional environment. Now, going back to the sedimentologists doing fieldwork and studying that uh, modern day fluvial depth environment, right? that fluvial depth environment there, um, the sedimentologists can now construct a conceptual model, a model in his mind, right? which can be visualized in the form of a map, platform view map, or a 3D block diagram, like in this case, right? So, this is, this is, a, a, this is a, this is a basically it's a cartoon representation of the actual environment here. But you just get the, the, the basic characteristics, summarize it right, into a simplified model. So this model is called a depositional or fascist model. Right? The, the mapping of fascists in the depositional environment provides understanding of the spatial distribution and the relationship between physical processes operating in the environment and the result of deposit. And the understanding can be summarized in the conceptual three-dimensional block diagram or map. And we call this kind of model a fascist model or a depositional model. Okay, so from um, uh, studies of modern day different environments, you can construct a fascist model, right? I guess you can you can understand the, the use of this. You know, it's, it's, well, it's for understanding, right? Um, you can now uh, have a, a view in your mind how things are arranged in a specific different environment. You know that there's going to be coarser sand in the channels, finer sand on the on the flanks, and so on, right? Well. Uh, you can also use uh, fascist and fascist models to interpret 
ancient sediment era. So you probably uh, read some papers or uh, um, heard some talks by, by some of our visiting lecturers on, you know, interpreting ancient different environments. We say things like um, fluvial different environment or the red mudstones of Langon red beds were deposited in a glacial marine the same environment. How do they come up with these kinds of interpretations? Which is not just mere arm waving, but there is a systematic method to geological interpretation. Fascist and fascist models can be used to interpret ancient sedimentary rocks. And this is based on that old precept, right? Uh, Hutton's uh, principle of uniformitarianism, right? Geological actualism. Uh, I see that in some of your on your t-shirts of your clubs, right? The present is the key to the past. Right? What does this mean? Now we all live in the same universe, and the universe has universal physical laws, and we can safely assume that in the past uh, the laws were the same. Right? Given that the laws of the universe are constant throughout time, uh, the same physical processes would have interacted with sediments of the ancient past. So let's say you go back in the history of the Earth 500 million years ago, you would have had a sea and the waves would be operate, will be interacting with the sea bottom. So you will get symmetrical ripples when waves are interacting with uh, fine grain sand in shallow water. Even 500 million years ago, you get the same kind of physical processes operating. Okay, so you assume that you can, um, if you get uh, fasc the same kinds of fascists um, preserved in the rock record, they must have been formed by the same kind of processes operating today. Uh, cross beds uh, form in rivers today. Okay? Uh, rivers will still, uh, if you go to ancient rocks and you find cross beds in ancient rocks, uh, you, can, you can make the same kind of interpretation that they were formed by a unidirectional current. Right? Similar fascists will be produced by similar processes. So, so it's basically you're just working the other way around. Right? You're going, let's say you, you are a sedimentologist and you are visiting this outcrop here, right? And in this case, you have an outcrop and it is composed of a succession of classic rocks. Uh, it finds upward from cross-bedded sandstone at the bottom, grading uh, upward into fine ripple cross limited sandstones, and then grades upward into clays and siltstones and, uh, at the top, right? Now, uh, if this was the same sedimentologist working on the previous uh, Fluvial, the same environment setting, right? That study there on the modern uh, fluvial setting, he or she would have observed that, hey, I got the same kind of deposits here, right? I got cross bedded sandstones, I got cross bedded sands, I got fine ripple sands, and then yeah, I have these fines at the top. Yeah? In terms of fascist composition, these are just litified sands and muds, right? And they show the same kinds of sedimentary structures and textures. And so I can construct a model. I can interpret this and say that these rocks, which are 100 million years old, were deposited in the same kind of depth environment, a meandering river system. So we can interpret it. We can interpret um, the depth environment based on our, our understanding of fascist models. Okay. So you go from this outcrop to interpretation of fluvial depth environment. So in the previous class, uh, we've looked at uh, the different types of bed forms and other sedimentary structures that can develop uh, due to different processes, right? And we even did a practical experiment try to form uh, ripples in, in our small flume tank right, upstairs. Right? So yeah, we understand that different processes, waves or universal currents or gravity flows, can produce different fascis, the types of deposits. And if you know the fascis, you can interpret the process that formed it. Right? You can use the product, the fascis itself, to infer 
the original process. This is called the process product relationship. For example, here, um, a unidirectional current flow operating on non cohesive sediment can result in the formation of bed forms such as asymmetrical ripples or dunes or plain beds, which can be preserved in the rock record as planar lamination, ripple cross lamination, cross bedding, and so on. Right? Uh, if you have waves, you can develop things like symmetrical ripples or plain beds, yeah? and these can also be preserved in the rock record. You have soft sediment deformation, and you can have preservation of things like load casts and slump structures, right? And erosive scouring can result in the preservation of flute casts and gutter casts. And if you have gravity flows, they can form products such as Bauma sequences or poly sorted sed sedimentary rocks called debrides. Okay? So if you have these deposits, you can interpret the process relatively, com uh, roughly, relatively confidently. So now let's look at the actual method of interpreting the frame alignments. How do you do it? Um, there's a systematic way, and the uh, and this uh, method is called Fasci's analysis, right? A set of methods used to interpret sedimentary rocks. Uh, it is based on the interpretation of the uh, character of Fasci's. Uh, these things that we call Fasci associations and Fasci successions. Don't worry about the terms. We'll come back to that later. Yeah. Yeah. We interpret them in terms of the processes responsible for their genesis. And this is followed by the deduction of the most likely depositional environments in which the inferred processes may have operated. So now this is the basic workflow uh, for conducting Fasci's analysis. Right? This is from Dalrymple 2010. Um, but just remember, it's, it's, it, um, doing Fasci's analysis is not going to be as straightforward as this. There's going to be some loops in, in different parts here. Right? But generally, this is going to be the how you do it. So you start with making observations uh, depending on what kind of study you're doing. And sometimes you are looking at uh, core. Right? You have a, somebody has drilled into the subsurface, maybe several kilometers uh, underground, and we have a vertical succession of sedimentary rocks. I need to interpret that, right? And you can do that. You can use the Fasci's analysis workflow on those kinds of samples. Or you are doing outcrop work. And you can also use the Fasci's analysis workflow. Now, what you do is you need to draw a sedimentary log, like we've learned in the field in Perlis, right? We've done this already. Uh, and then you need to break the succession of sedimentary rock there into individual fasces. Right? And once you have your fasces, you need to interpret your fasces. You, you deduce the processes responsible for each fasces, right? So mudstone, suspension, sandstone, bed load, and so on. Right? You make your interpretations there. But you, you don't stop there. You just have an interpretation of the processes. Now, you need to find larger scale patterns, you know, groups of fasces. Sometimes you see re re repeatable patterns in how the fasces are stacked vertically, right? So you combine your fasces into these associations of fasces, fasces associations, right? And sometimes you can get larger scale um, patterns, and we call them fasci successions. Right? Now, you have your data, in, uh, you, have, you have converted it into fasces and also these larger scale fascist patterns or fascist associations, now you need to go to the library and integrate knowledge gain from fascist models. So this is going to, you're not going to run away from reading. You need to uh, have, you need to uh, look at the different, uh, lots of these models have been published for different kinds of different environments, uh, rivers, uh, shallow marine environments, tidal flats, estuaries, and so on. And then you need to compare the characteristics of the fasces for the different environments with what you have in your study succession. So you de deduce the depth environment for, uh, for each fasces association or fasces succession. But before we continue, uh, just, uh, let's, let's go a little bit into the philosophy here. We've 
touched on this a little bit, you know, I, I, but mostly on the academic side. So, okay, we, we can interpret ancient Egyptian environments and we can look at broad things like reconstruct earth history. We can understand changes in climate, tectonics and deposition. These are important topics, of course. These are very important, right? But uh, on the practical side also, um, you know these fascist maps and models and you're making maps and models kind of work um, they can actually help us in uh, predicting uh, managing and exploiting earth resources right so fascist can be used for mineral exploitation let's say you can use this model of a river again right so maybe certain kinds of minerals that you want are just uh, found inside the channel so it'll be very useful to know uh, the trends of the channels, are they going north-south, um, uh, the, the distribution, right? are they concentrated at certain certain localities and so on. Um, or maybe um, water is also restricted to certain kinds of um, certain kinds of rocks, let's say you have reservoir rocks here, that can be the aquifer inside your sandstones here, or even hydrocarbons, right? So they are quite useful in terms of trying to get out of resources okay so going back to the fascist analysis workflow so the first thing you do let's say in this case you have an outcrop right so you need to um, describe the rocks and you need to describe it systematically and you use this um, style of note taking that we call a sedimentary law and you've done this already in Perlis right in the, during the field trip so these are examples of sedimentary logs and what you have here is basically a horizontal axis where you have the Arden Wentworth grade scale for grain size, right? So in this case, you're going from fine grain from the left and becoming coarser towards the right, right? Clay, silt, sand, very fine, fine, medium, and so on. Right? Then on the vertical scale here, you have your thickness. So you have a zero, one, two meters, and so on, right? So remember, if you're working with core, you're going um, downwards into the subsurface, this vertical scale will not be thickness, but it will be vertical depth. So it gets deeper and deeper. So it's going from zero here to one to two, and it goes deeper and deeper, right? Okay, so you have a sedimentary rock. Inside here, you can fill in the, the yeah, you can, you, can, you can take note of the grain size, yes? stretch your drawing until here let's say so here you are at silt and then you can then even take note of the thickness right so these beds are less than 50 centimeters thick and then you can draw in sedimentary structures as you uh, as you see them in outcrop okay so there are lots of different styles of drawing sedimentary rocks. So here, you, the, the, the guy is uh, trying to draw it as realistic as possible. So you have a cartoon representation of the rocks. But sometimes people use this kind of method, right? So you just use simple symbols. Both uh, record the same kinds of features, right? So it depends on you, your preference, yeah, depending, depending on your skill in drawing and so on. Right? So don't really need to stick to this format. Um, you can even use symbols or lots of different kinds of styles. Shows, um, throughout this lecture, I'll show you also uh, other different examples of sedimentary logs. Okay, so don't worry. So this is another example of a sedimentary log. Right. So in this case, you have depth for vertical scale. So you are dealing with a subsurface core. We're drilling downward. So notice the depths here: three thousand one hundred meters and so on. Okay, uh, this person here has put in other kinds of details like rock type uh, percentage as a column here, right? And in this case, uh, you're going from finer to coarse towards the left. And even in this case, you even add some arrows to show you uh, rough patterns of coarsening upward and fining upwards and so on. But remember, if you're drawing, a, if, you, if you're uh, preparing a sedimentary log, you also need to prepare a symbol legend. So people can understand uh, what what do the different symbols mean here. Um, so this is, this method of note taking, sedimentary logging, is more practical. It's much faster rather than taking lots of notes. You just use symbols, and and you can just directly draw the thickness 
and the green size of the different beds you observe. So now you have a sedimentary log, you've described your rocks, now you need to subdivide your sedimentary succession into individual fundamental building blocks, your fasces, right? So that's the definition of fasces, just to remind you. So you, you just uh, subdivide the sediment succession into uh, discrete units. For example, these are two examples of fasces. This is, I just give it the name graded sandstone fasces here. And it will have a certain set of characteristics, a certain lithology, very fine to find in sandstone, a uh, certain thickness, 3 to 50 centimeters, and it has some characteristics such as normal grading, sharp base, and a gradational top, which is typical for this kind of rock. And then I have another fasces here. I call it, you can call it whatever you like, but here I call it wavy bedded fasces because it has these ripples which are wavy in shape. Right? And we have a certain thickness to them and certain lithology associated with the fasces, right? So, uh, yeah, so. It's just, yeah, it's just uh, two different fasces are just two different rock types, right? Two different with different characters. Just remember, your fasces definition must be objective. It must be based on observations, and it must be understood that each fasces will be given a process interpretation. So you take note of sedimentological characteristics, things like sedimentary structures. Uh, the green size, the sorting, and so on. This might hold clues, sorry, clues uh, about the physical process that formed these deposits, and also the depth environment. But then uh, the, it, it also depends on the type of study you're doing. If you are interested in uh, weathering history, let's say, you might want to take note of the, the weathering character of the different fasces, or the diagenetic character. If you're uh, doing a diagenetic um, study, right? And remember, you can also use fasces for uh, other kinds of rocks, metamorphic rocks, or even igneous rocks. They're just uh, differentiating different types of rocks yeah, to help you understand the variety of rocks you have in 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 what you are studying. Yeah? Okay. So, but just to help you in trying to uh, construct your fasces, right? These are the common types of criteria you use. You can use uh, for all kinds of rocks. You can use things like bedding, sedimentary structures, the type of fossils you get inside it, the context between the fasces, whether they are erosional or gradational, or even color. For classic rocks specifically, you can use uh, textures such, um, such as sorting and grain size. For carbonates, which I will not cover in, 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 in this course, uh, and look at the ratio between the greens and the fine grain mud, or even the types of greens you see inside the rock. So the common characters uh, used in fasci subdivision uh, are things like green size, sorting, uh, sedimentary structures, fossil content, and so on. Just to show you an example, another fasces here. I'm calling this cross bedded sandstone fasces. And I can summarize the character. It is made up of medium grain sandstones and it displays um, cross bedding. So that's my fasces, right? An example of a finished uh, fasces analysis. Yeah. So you have, here you have a sedimentary log at the side. And this is from subsurface core, so it's getting deeper and deeper as go further downwards, right? And that's the those are these are the core samples which have been described in the sedimentary log here, right? So you can see things like um, it's getting it's getting muddy as go further upwards. You get sedimentary structures like ripples, some bitubation, right? And then you can div subdivide this into basic building blocks. So these are um, my fasces constructed based on observations of the core. So the yellow color can be considered as a single fasces. This is your cross bedded sandstone fasces here, right? And notice they can repeat themselves, okay? So they're not just, they're not, uh, one fasces is not just, cannot just be constructed as a single part. They can be found at other parts also. So remember that, right? So some students just tend to just, just do uh, sedimentary log and just do 
uh, make one fascist at the bottom, one fascist in the middle, and then watch fascist in the top. So that is wrong, right? You can have fascists repeating themselves at different stratigraphic positions. So remember that, right? So you have yellow colored fascists, that's another one fascist here, and with a certain character to them. And then you have this muddier fascist, that's another fascist. And then from this, I can construct a fascist scheme, a fascist diagram here. Here, it's just a summary of all the different types of fascists I see in my study core, let's say. Right? So as a summary, in this case, I only have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. I have nine fascists observed in the core. And these are their characters in terms of their thickness, their rock type, lithology, sedimentary structures. And then I can interpret how they were deposited based on uh, my understanding of sedimentology and my, and my reading, right? So how do you name fascists? Fascists can be given in informal designations. You can you can call them fascists A, B, C, um, or fascists one, two, three, and so on, right? Or you can give a brief descriptive designation. If your fascist has cross bedding side, they call it cross bedded sandstone fascists. Or if you have a simpler fascist, let's say a must, uh, it's a uh, it's a rock dominated by mudstone, call it a mudstone fascist, right? And just remember, this kind of work takes time, right? Uh, it's not going, your subdivision is not just going to pop up automatically. You need to look at the rocks, and only after several days or several weeks, you start to come up with an understanding of how many fascists you have. Right? So another example, in this case, this is from outcrop. Uh, this is my own work. Uh, this is from Sarawak, Yellow Formation. Uh, so I have this exposure of rock. And again, it's finding upward, right? And I've divided it into several kinds of fascis here. The bottom part is dominated by this yellow colored fascis called, which I call cross bedded sandstones. It finds upward into uh, this uh, other kind of fascis, SHH, my sandy heterolis, made up of small ripples with interbedded mud in between. And go into these muddier fascis here at the top. And then I come up with a fasci scheme here, and I summarize the different kinds. Uh, yeah, summarize the characters, right? Lithology, sedimentary structure, and then come up with an interpretation. Very similar to what we did with the core. Um, notice here, uh, all the cross bedded sandstones, fasci's are lumped together at the bottom. It doesn't have to be that way. Sometimes it can repeat itself. Just be careful. Okay. Okay. So we know how to subdivide a sedimentary succession into fascists using a certain set of uh, criteria which have sedimentological significance, right? They can help us to interpret the environment. But what scale do we use? How thick can my fascists be? Are they just uh, uh, things which are centimeter in scale? Can my fascists be 100 meter in scale? Yeah. What scale do I use? Well, it depends. Yeah? Uh, fascists can be defined on different scales, uh, the individual beds or grouping of similar beds. We can, you know, larger scale bodies comparable to members of formations can be called fascists, right? Remember, the fascist analysis method is a method. Right? It's just a way of doing things. So, uh, different people have different uh, different objectives, right? But they still follow the, the same approach. Right? It depends on your objective. If you are doing a regional description, a very wide area, you might want to have broad subdivision of your fascists. Right? Maybe a small number of fascists, and they are very thick. But if you are doing more detailed sedimentological study, you make finer subdivisions of your succession. So I'll show you some examples here. So let's say you are doing a very detailed study of of this small exposure here. It's just one meter thick. Right? You're interested in the, the thin beds here and right? the thin scale variations in fascies, right? So, um, in this case, your fascies are decimeter in thickness, tens of centimeters thick. So, for example, here, this sedimentologist has divided the succession into one fascist that we call hamaki, cross stratified sandstone at the bottom here. And there's only one example which is overlain by a laminated sandstone fascist here, made up of parallel lamination. And notice, this fascist repeats itself above here. Both beds here have the same character. So I call them the same fascist, the same name. 
And then I have a third fasces, a lenticular bedded fasces, lenses of sand interbedded with mudstone here. So I have three fasces here, and my fasces are thin. Now I can construct uh, fasces at different scales. If I'm looking at a larger scale outcrop, my fasces here are going to be thicker. So in this case, uh, this is an exposure which is tens of meters thick. Right? And I've divided it into two types of fasces. One is fasces one. Then you have fasces two. Which is, oh, sorry. So I have fasces one made up of muddier deposits. And then fasces two which is made up of sandier deposits. So I have two fasces there. And these are much thicker. These are meter thick now. Right? Okay, so now we've uh, we've constructed our sedimentary log. We've subdivided our sedimentary succession into discrete fasces, and different fasces uh, form form are formed by different processes. Have we learned in sedimentology? Great. Now we can interpret the depositional environments. We can know whether it's a river or not. Hold on. No, it's not that straightforward. Uh, you have to remember. Individual fasces usually reflect specific physical processes. They just tell us the process. And that's going to be important. Eh? Individual fasces are usually not unique to a single depositional environment. What does this mean? So let's take this example. I have a cross bedded sandstone fasces here, right? Okay, so I can interpret that in terms of physical process. You know, we've done the flume tank experiment. We know this already again. So cross bedded sandstone, so these were dunes. So the flow that formed it was turbulent, subcritical, and unidirectional, right? All you know this. Again. So you know to get dunes and cross beds, right? But remember, dunes can be formed in lots in a variety of different deposition environments. You can get dunes in deserts, Eolian. You can get dunes in rivers, fluvial. You can even get dunes along the coast, huh? in tidal channels. You can even get dunes in shallow marine areas, on the shelf itself, as tidal ridges or sand waves. And even in deep water, you can get dunes in turbidites. So there are too many possibilities if you want to interpret the environment based on the fasces alone. Another ex two examples here. If you have a structureless mudstone fasces, even if you want to interpret physical processes, there is still some variation. Uh, structureless mudstone can be developed through flocculation of mud and rapid deposition, or you just have lots of animals digging into the mud, you get a structureless texture. Right? So intense bioturbation. Now in terms of in the environment, there are still too many possibilities. You can get this fasces in fluvial, coastal, shallow marine, and deep water environments. Same goes for this, planar lambda sandstones. Interpretation in terms of process is easy, high velocity flow, transport deposition. But depth of environment is going to be more difficult. Lots of different kinds of the environments have the same fasces. So you need another way. You, you need to do a little bit more work to interpret the different environment. You need to identify these things that we call fasces association. Now, sedimentologists uh, have observed that there is a tendency for a given environment to be associated with a particular assemblage of fasces. So if you're interested in interpreting depth of environment, what is more important is the grouping of fasces. Let's say, for example, here, I have cross-bedded conglomerate fasces associated with massive conglomerate, associated with cross-bedded sandstone, with plain beds and ripples. And they are they form this repetitive finding upward succession, right? So now I am more confident that the inception environment was most likely to be a fluvial channel based on our understanding of sedimentology. But grouping is more important. So you need to study the fasces communally as a group. You need to combine genetically related fasces. You don't you don't have need you must not have unconformities in between your fasces, okay? Because everything must be conformable based on Walter's law, do you remember, right? And you combine these genetically related fasces into large scale fascist associations. Example. 
Now we are back at that um, outcrop which was tens of meters thick, and yet you have this sedimentary log, right? And then if you've you've already subdivided the sedimentary section into fasces here, with different color codes, right? Uh, those are your fasces here. Okay. But now you need to find larger scale patterns. You need to find characteristic repeated assemblages of a limited suite of fasces. Right? So here I've divided the sedimentary succession into fasces associations. What I've observed is that I have actually two different kinds of patterns. One, I have these muddier successions here, which are meter stick, right? And made up of thin ripples interbedded with mudstone. I'm calling that one fascist association. I call it FA8. Eh? I'm calling that name here. And then I identify another kind of pattern which repeats itself. These sandier packages here, made up of uh, wavy bedded ripples interbedded with thin mud drapes in between, right? So I call it fascist association 4. So I have two fascist associations, and uh, I have two fascist associations here. Notice that uh, the fascist associations repeat themselves, right? And also, the, these uh, different examples of the same fascist association are not exactly the same. Notice here, this one is thicker than the overlying same fascist association, right? And take a compared to this one also, right? And here you have cross beds in the middle of your fascist association, which are absent in the other examples of FA4. Okay? So they don't have to be exactly the same, but they share similar characteristics. Okay? So uh, small details are, can be explained by uh, local variations in the processes. Right? So here is there's probably more scouring and higher energy deposits high energy uh, currents so you start to get dunes being developed right so these different fascist associations can actually represent different parts of your fascist model there right so here i have a delta definite environment right so my finer grain deposits can be interpreted as part of my pro delta for the seaward and my sandy packages are more of the distributary mouth bar part of my delta so I'm making interpretations based on understanding of sedimentology. So one final example of using Fasci's association. Okay, so everybody here has heard about Bauma sequences. I believe you've seen some examples in Pahang, well, on the road to Mersing during your Fusing field trip, right? Structural geology field trip, right? So these can be considered as Fasci's associations, right? So you have an outcrop, and you start to see repetitive patterns in the outcrop. Yeah, you see these beds and the beds are made up of more than one fascist. So I, just, I focus on just one bed here and I zoom it in and this is what I get. Uh, a normal graded bed going from structural sandstone fascist at the bottom into parallel laminated sandstone which is fascist B into cross laminated sandstones which is C, D which is laminated silt and then uh, structural mudstone at the top, and these can be considered different fasces. Um, individually, they won't be that much help in interpreting uh, a different environment. But if you look at it as a whole, as a group of fasces, as a fasces solution, you start to say, ah, these are turbidites. Uh, these are gravity flow deposits. Uh, uh, in underwater, you have a slope, and you get a mixture of sediment and water, and this mixture moves below seawater and is deposited as a turbidite. Okay? So remember, you cannot interpret depth environments just by looking at individual fasces. You need, need to look at the overall pattern of the assemblage of fasces, your fasces um, association. Right? So don't worry. Uh, uh, in the coming lectures, in, 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 in the next few weeks, we'll, we'll look at examples of different depth environments. Right? And have a look at uh, the fasces composition and arrangement inside these depth environments. Okay? So you will, now, you will be able to uh, differentiate between a fluvial depth environment from a shore phase, from a tidal flat, or submarine fan.
Okay, so that is for the next few weeks. Okay, uh, for now I will uh, I'll just end uh, the the lecture here, but uh, don't worry, I'll get, just I'll provide you with some practical exercises, um, and upload it on Spectrum. And remember, uh, stay safe. Um, don't go to crowded areas yeah, during this these two weeks. Um, um, wash your hands thoroughly. Twenty seconds, right? Yeah. Uh, j just be careful. Uh, okay. So that, that's it. Okay. Assalamualaikum.